Chapter 7, Game Day. The weekend of the hockey tournament, Byron broke his arm and Cole finished the mirror. The first event happened during a semifinal match against the Bennington Minutemen. Up 1-0 in the second period, Byron put on a one-man show on defense. He knocked pucks out of the air, robbed the attackers, even nutmegged their best player, stealing the puck off his stick, setting it between his legs, and carrying it up the far side of the rink. However, trying to dig the puck out of the back corner, Byron got slammed into the boards. He initially thought the snap he heard came from his hockey stick breaking, but when he looked down and saw his intact composite shaft stick, then started to register the searing pain in his arm, he knew something had gone terribly wrong. One trip to the ER at Central Vermont Hospital, two x-rays, a set bone, a fiberglass cast, and a prescription for painkillers later, they were on their way home with the classic rock blaring from the radio. In the back seat, Byron made a call to a teammate of, on his mom's Nokia and found that they'd been defeated 4-2. to two. Well, we lost the semis, he announced. His dad turned down the radio, then putting on a fake Canadian accent, said into the mirror, Ooks endured a season-ending injury, eh? And without him, it was a season-ending injury for his team, too, eh? Eh? His dad persisted. What are you thinking about back there? Quit it, Byron had complained. Hey, cheer up, fella. You now got proof that your team can't make it without you. You're not just a grinder. You're a star. This was supposed to make him feel better, but ironically, Byron felt embarrassed by it. As an introvert, he didn't much care for attention. He'd rather blend into the background. He had to admit, though, that in a paradoxical sort of way, he did want to be a star. Not for the fame, no, but because he liked to see his work pay off. He wanted to be the hardest working, most respected, and best. He was both gratified and humiliated by any public recognition. I think I might go back to the old wood-handled stick, Byron said, looking at his cast. Why? his dad asked. Byron smiled sheepishly. I think the composite is stronger than my skeleton. I'd rather have a broken stick than this, he held up his cast. The phone, still in Byron's lap, rang. It was Cole. Hello? Byron? Yeah, it's me. I broke my arm, he offered. Ouch, you okay? Still at the hospital? Yeah, I'm fine. And nope, we're on our way home. I finished. It's done, he said. You plug it in yet? Yeah, Cole lowered his voice. But stop saying suspicious things. Mom and Dad are hearing your side of the conversation. Oh, right, Byron agreed. The mirror is sort of opaque reflective, bright, bright blue-green, and hums like a giant fluorescent light. It's real magnetic, too. Pulled down the curtain rod. Huh, Byron answered, feigning non-interest. I can see a forest scene on the other side. I'm going to throw a ball through, see what happens. No, wait for me. How long? An hour? We're nearly across the river. A long pause, Cole sighed. Okay, he finally answered. But how am I supposed to resist? I don't know, Byron quipped. Maybe paint some more of your skull-faced miniatures, or, he snorted, or go into my room and try and find another alternate ending on Chrono Trigger. We still haven't won it with Magus. You're suggesting, he could hear amusement in his brother's tone, that to pass the time before testing my electrical portal, I play a video game about a malfunctioning electrical portal that sent a young man and his friends on a time-hopping adventure? Yep, sure I am. <laughs> okay, he chuckled. Great, can do. Tell Dad to step on it. If you're not here in an hour, I leave you no guarantees. I'll try. See you soon. Bye. Byron turned off the phone and handed it back to his mom. How's Cole? He's good. Bored. Wants, a, wants us to get home. Did he finally finish that computer project he was working on? Don't know, Byron lied. He didn't say. From the front seat, his dad made a comment about classic rock somehow becoming the music from his teenage years, and then began to turn the radio back up. But then his mom continued talking. This was a regular occurrence. Charlie rolled his eyes at Byron in the mirror and good-naturedly lowered the volume. How's your arm feel now, sweetie? Byron's mom asked. Hurts. You feeling up to some lunch? You bet, he replied. Let's go someplace with a drive through though. The problem with his dad and driving was that he always took some windy back way to avoid traffic. Sure, this convoluted country route cut 20 miles off the trip, but it was a full of frost heaves, potholes, and slow farm-use-only pickups that blew nauseating exhaust, and it lacked any meaningful restaurants or rest areas. Despite its seemingly direct route on the map, the backway would take a full 15 minutes longer to complete than the roundabout interstate option. We're driving through Fairley and Orford, his mom said. There's got to be something. Something ended up being donuts. 
Two chocolate crullers, a hot mocha, and a Boston cream later, they were on their way again, bumping along Route 25A and listening to his mom lecture his dad about the need to take his early-stage diabetes more seriously. This as he drank an iced coffee that was 65% sugar and heavy cream. Finally, after the interminable trip, they pulled off River Road into their driveway. They passed the two white oak saplings and the painted slate sign adorned with acorns and declaring, Oaks, Oaks, a joke of his father's. Apparently in England, houses used to have names instead of numbers, and he'd always been jealous. The gray clabbers of the siding mirrored the gray overcast of the New Hampshire sky. Byron swung his creaking door open, inhaling the coniferous aroma of the nearby woods. Hemlocks. The sun warmed his skin. 38 degrees on the first weekend in February. The layer of frozen mud under the gravel in the driveway had melted. Harold barked down from the upstairs window, and Byron smiled up at him. Go on inside, I'll get your stuff, his dad ordered. Cole met him at the door, headphones around his neck. Byron waved his injured arm. Son of a, Cole remarked. Rather than replacing cuss words, as his brother did, Cole handled the problem by omitting them entirely. What happened? Checked and wrecked. Broken arm. Radius or ulna? Ulna, Byron answered, two and a half inches from the elbow. Harold bounded down the stairs, turned the corner, scraped his nails ineffectually on the hardwood, and nearly bowled Byron over. Okay, okay, it's good to see you too, he laughed, ruffling the shepherd's hair with his good hand, while the dog licked his pants, probably for donut crumbs. How's the mirror? Before Cole could answer, their mom and dad bustled through the door, burdened with hockey equipment and talking over each other. Then the story of Byron's injury was requested and reenacted. A good ten minutes passed before his mother began rooting through the refrigerator, fretting over dinner. I hate these weekend tournaments, she complained. The week's going to start tomorrow, and I haven't even been to the grocery store. Why don't I drive you, his dad offered. The kids will be all right at home for a couple hours. She looked doubtfully at Byron's arm. How's it feeling? Fine, Mom, he repeated with exasperation. You know you can have more medicine at 2.15. I know. She looked back at his father. I think they'll be fine, he said. We'll be perfect, Mom, Cole cut in. I'm here. I have my license. If anything goes wrong, I'll call. Promise. Hey, Charlie cut in. I'm thinking of stopping by Blockbuster on my way home. Anything you want to rent? Yeah, Byron jumped in, temporarily ending his mom's fretting. I kind of want to watch Stargate again, he thought for a moment. Or that cartoon series, Gargoyles, he added. I missed... A couple, season, a couple episodes last season. What about you? Charlie turned to Cole. See if Apollo 13's out on video yet. Oh, and I've heard that Interview with a Vampire is pretty great too. Get that, will you? After a few more moments of fretting over Byron, Felicity and her husband left, taking the Jeep to Hannaford for the week's grocery trip. Finally, Cole sighed, leaning against the door. Let's go. And he led the way upstairs.